I'm just going to share a little snippet from the word. I'm focusing on the same topic that we're all going to be looking at today. And, um, and I've asked you to look at your observations of uh, Acts chapter two, just one chapter today. But I want to take um, a moment just to put the focus on uh, the whole prophetic season that we're living in as a church. Uh, God has been speaking very clearly to us over this period of time. And it's become more and more evident, for both prophetically uh, in, in our church body, that there is a new season that is coming on us. And uh, so I want to uh, I want to share with you today a word from the word. And um, are you guys seeing word from the word there? Yep, great. All right. So I want to uh, focus on one word today, which is a common word in the book of Acts, and it's the word daily. And so <clears throat> in, in the book of Acts, uh, they were not cont content to meet one, one day a week for services as per usual. In fact, we see in the scriptures that the early believers were daily and actively involved in expanding the kingdom of God. They weren't of the once a week variety. Uh, for example, they met daily. Uh, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together, Acts 2.46. They cared daily for the needs of those that were around them, Acts 6.1. Their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. So they had a daily operating uh, system of delivering food for those that were widowed, those that couldn't provide for themselves. And uh, there were a few hiccups that were going on there, but they were actively involved showing their faith by their works. They cared daily. They won souls daily. Acts 2.47, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. What an amazing picture of God at work. Uh, they searched the scriptures daily. Acts 17.11, they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't take uh, their dusty Bibles off the shelf uh, for the Sunday service and put it under their arm and head off into the car. No, daily they were in the scriptures checking out and examining if these things were so. The Bible says, and they increased in number daily, Acts 16.5. So the churches were strengthened and the faith and grew daily numerically and you know I look at this and does it sound exhausting well the amazing thing it wasn't exhausting and I think of the prophetic picture that we've been given this morning by both uh, Richard and, all, and, and also Blair of you know floating downstream on the current and it became very evident reading through the book of Acts that they were on a current of God's love as they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were fueled by God's power to daily involve themselves in impacting the communities and the world that they lived in at that time in history. So my question today is, what are some keys to the daily excitement for Jesus? Maintaining a daily excitement and walking with Jesus and our brothers and sisters takes place when we've firmly fixed our hearts on what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, this became evident. The book of Acts is actually a record of the commission they were given in the very first few verses of Acts chapter 1, where Jesus said to them, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's dunamis, which means God's divine ability. So he's saying, I don't want you to do this in your strength. What I'm about to do in this church is going to be powered by me. And you will be co-workers working with my spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So what? The following chapters in Acts is all about is actually fulfilling the purpose that God designed them for to fulfill this great mission that he gave to the early Christians. And we see people risking all manner of things. They gave up their time. They gave up their fears. They gave up their finances. They gave up their reputation. And why was that? That's because they'd become gripped with the mission to be Jesus' witnesses 
and all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And in fact, if you look a little bit closely at that, you'll actually see that that verse is actually a table of contents for the rest of the book of Acts. So from Acts chapter 1 to 7, it tells of their witness in Jerusalem, the localized city that they all started in when the Spirit was poured out upon them on Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 8, verse chapter 8 down to chapter 11 tells of their witness in Judea and Samaria. And then Acts 12 to 28, the rest of the book of Acts, moves outside of Judea and Samaria and takes them to the ends of the earth. And I'd like to put on the end of that timeline, 2021, it's now our turn to continue the journey. Or if you like, there's 28 chapters in Acts. It's now Acts 29. We are to write the final chapter of the book of Acts. So we see that their faith was a day-to-day -day -day reality. It wasn't what is so often uh, the case in modern Christianity where church is simply known as a building that we attend once a week on a regular routine. In fact, the stats tell us it's a little bit worse than that. Uh, the average Christian attends church 1.7 times uh, per month, according to the st rest recent statistics that have come out of America. It used to be a lot higher, but now with the pandemic and et cetera, everything's uh, caused that routine to start collapsing. So why was, why was it that their faith was a day-to-day -day reality? And it was because they'd locked onto the mission. They were living their lives with purpose. And I see this as the great downfall of the church. We've reduced our Christianity to being an attender of something that is an institutionalized format or a ritual. And these new Christians in the book of Acts, they wouldn't allow themselves to, to be diluted or watered down. They were living a daily existence where they were impacting their immediate uh, surroundings that they were living in. And they had the fire of God burning in their hearts. So my question is, is it possible for us to reclaim that type of Christianity that we see in the book of Acts that you're going to be talking about in your breakout rooms? So what makes up the ingredients of living on daily mission for Jesus as a witness for Jesus? What are the ingredients? A bit like if you, you're, any of you have made a cake, which some we've already seen, some of you have been baking cakes over lockdown. You know, you only need to miss one of those ingredients and your cake is not going to turn out too good. And so let's have a look at three key ingredients this morning of what it means uh, to live daily on mission with Jesus. And the first one that I want to talk about today is Logos. And uh, the early church considered themselves witnesses. So to be a witness, you've got to have seen something and you share what you have seen. And they had witnessed this amazing story of a man who was born of a virgin. He walked amongst the people, declaring the works and the word of God. And he suffered an agonizing death on behalf of the sins of the world. He rose again three days later. And he commissioned all who received him to go and live this amazing life too, to become witnesses. So this is what we commonly know as the good news. This is what we've been teaching the kids in Kids Church this morning online. The good news, which is the gospel. This is the message, the logos, the word. And so each one of the early uh, church Christians, believers, they knew the logos. They knew what the message was that they were to spread. And we can see the verse, Acts 2.32, that Peter preached. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of this fact. So this is what they began to speak. The Logos, the message that they began to speak was about a resurrected Christ that we've seen, and we want to share this amazing story. So that's the first ingredient of this cake. The second word I want to share with you this morning is another Greek word, which is pronounced ethos. And some of you have probably heard about ethos before, where we talk about, you know, the ethos of an organization. This is the way things are done around here. It's who we are. It's our way of life. That's what ethos means. And so each one of the early believers, they had an ethos, an inner reality that went with them wherever they went. They weren't doubting. 
They weren't walking in fear. They had a strong ethos or an inner reality of the message, the logos, that they were proclaiming. We can't just have a message and deliver it with a floppy fish handshake. Have you ever had someone shake your hand and it, sh and it feels like a wet fish uh, that you're shaking? They did it with a great deep inner conviction. They had an inner reality or an ethos that the logos that they carried, the message that they were to share was so fixed inside of them that this is what took the Barnabases, the Pauls, the Silases, this inner ethos of a reality that traveled with them wherever they went. So much so that, you know, we find Paul in the book of Philippians, he actually was under guard with the Praetorium guards. They were, they were entrusted to look after this prisoner called Paul. And in Philippians, we see these amazing words of his ethos, this inner reality that he had within his life that actually um, was passed on to them. And let me read you the verses. He says this. Now, I want you to know, Philippians 1, verse 12, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, that means his imprisonment, has actually advanced the gospel. So him going to prison actually advanced the cause of the gospel. Why? Verse 13 so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard or the praetorium guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Isn't that amazing? The guards got time to hang around Paul and he had the logos. That's the good news, the message of the good news. But he also had inside of him an ethos that was unshakable, an inner reality of the goodness and the reality of Christ in him, the hope of glory that it spread even to those who were entrusted to guard him and to watch over him. And it emanated out of that prison cell to all who were connected with those that had contact with Paul. He was infectious with the gospel, with that ethos that he carried. And the third and final ingredient is another Greek word. This is the pathos which is the word passion, passion. Every single believer we see in the early church carried an unmistakable passion for the mission of God that they took with them. So they carried the logos, the message of the good news. They had an unshakable inner reality, their ethos. But thirdly, they had their pathos, their passion where every morning they got up and they were passionate about touching people's lives for the gospel. So wherever they found themselves, they were they were the, the rub off effect of their faith, their contagiousness was taking place. And we see Peter at Pentecost, remember, and it was only a, a, a few days earlier that Peter had actually denied Christ, or a few weeks earlier that he had denied Christ before Jesus was crucified when he was arrested out of fear peter had actually cowered to fear and here he is now with a passion of fire and the message of the gospel standing up in front of thousands of people preaching the word we think of stephen who knew his life was at risk but he shared the logos anyway because of that inner ethos and that pathos the passion for jesus those three ingredients he was able to stand up and, and he was out the first known martyr to the early church where he died for his faith. We think of Paul standing before King Felix and uh, sharing his testimony that he nearly convinces him to become a Christian. So you're getting the picture here. And I just want to finish with a little story uh, of a man called George Whitfield, who was a great revivalist. And uh, George Whitfield. Uh, was preaching up in Edinburgh in Scotland and uh, people were so taken there was a revival that was going on they were so taken with the power of his preaching that he was doing 6 a.m services every day of the week and people would be getting out of bed at 5 a.m on there uh, in the morning and they would head out to hear George Whitfield preaching and there was a man by the name of David Hume who, uh, as he was heading to the meeting, he met one of the notorious Scottish philosophers and skeptics. 
and surprised to see him also on his way to hear Whitfield preach, the man said, I thought you didn't believe in the gospel, at which this philosopher and skeptic replied, he said, I do not, but he said, I know that George Whitfield definitely does. And he got out of the bed at 5 a.m. as a skeptic and as a philosopher because he saw a man who had logos, ethos, and pathos, which all bundled up, equaled a man who was daily living his life on mission for Jesus, carrying this, the reality of the gospel to his world. And it was undeniable that the skeptic and the philosopher would get out of bed just to go and hear him because he knew that he believed in what he was preaching. So as I finish, before we go into breakout rooms this morning, um, you know, I want us to just to remind us again, they met daily, they cared daily, they won souls daily, they searched the scriptures daily, and they increased in number daily. And as a church, I believe it's time for us to give opportunity to the Lord to make sure we haven't reduced our following of Jesus down to attending a Sunday morning service one day a week. We need to rediscover what it means to be on mission with Jesus every day of our life. And so in time to come, we're going to be exploring meeting in smaller groups on different days of the week, different locations in our communities. And so it may well be in time to come that you may be meeting with your group on a Friday night, and then you're going to be out on mission in your community on a Sunday morning at the markets and the sports clubs and cafes, helping people clean up their sections building bridges into the community. And, and the, way, the reason why I say that is simply this. Before you hit the panic button, just simply say this. Part, I believe part of the issue that's robbed the modern day church of our relevance is the fact that we have utilized most of our resources to focus around one meeting, one morning a week, Sunday morning, and what's taken place is that we've channeled all of our resources into that, including volunteers and time. And it's robbed us of time that we need to meet and discover people that we're living next door to, people that live in our, that are part of our, our workplaces, part of our community that we meet with each week. And as a result of that, this is what's happened, is that the, the stats are very clear and, and they're very evident done by Barna Research in America is that the average person who comes to Christ within five years, they have no unchurched friends that they're regularly in contact with. Isn't that a sad statistic? And so why is that? It's because our traditions have stopped us from actually connecting with the very people that we're called to reach. And so we put all of our resources into that Sunday morning service that takes up time both during the week and also on Sunday itself. And it's actually robbed us of being salt, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So will we still meet in larger gatherings? Of course, we're gonna meet in larger gatherings, but we've got to try and jumpstart this whole thing for us. And so we think that we're probably gonna end up, what we're gonna end up doing, and right now it's not even an issue, but what we're going to do is that we're going to schedule in once a month a big celebration where we're going to have food. We're going to share a meal together. There'll be fun. There'll be sharing the God stories of what's been happening in the past month and all of the groups that we've been meeting in. And we're going to um, explore and ask God to give us a fresh love for the people who live in our neighborhood, the people who need Jesus, and give some time to building bridges with those that need Christ in our lives. So for example, we're not gonna be able to meet probably for in a large gathering for another month at this point. Um, level two uh, will hopefully, Pam and Freddie are certainly hoping so, level two, you know, um, on October the 3rd is looking like it's, uh, uh, sorry, level three is finishing and we'll be going into level two, but we still can't meet in big gatherings at level two. And um, we, we also know how the government feels about Christians meeting at level two in large numbers um, because the, uh, the majority of the outbreak that's just happened recently came as a result of a large church gathering. Now, I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm just stating it as a reality. And so we need to get smarter 
And we need to actually chime in with what God is saying to us and actually begin to pray and say, God, what are you saying to us as a church at this time in terms of us having the logos, having the ethos, having the pathos and making it connect with people in our community by giving some time? You know, do you know all of your neighbors? Are you in a relationship? Are you in a on a talking basis? Have you had people in your neighborhood in times gone by when we were able to? Have you had them to your house? Have you gone to their house? Do you even know their names? You know, this is the call that we have on our lives to make a difference in the communities. God placed you at your address today for a reason, and that's because there's probably people on either living on either side of you that actually need to know Jesus. And God has located you right there to bring those ingredients of what it means to have a daily impact of the gospel on our brothers and sisters. So before we go into our breakout rooms, I just want to take an opportunity to pray for us all today. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each and every one of us this morning. I thank you, Lord, that in these changing times and these times that are demanding us to not hold on to the traditions of the past, but to look to you for leadership and to days that are filled with uh, troubled waters, Lord, days that are filled with particular tricky situations and scenarios. One thing hasn't changed, Lord, that even though we haven't been able, the church has not been able to meet on a Sunday, that should not stop the church from being who the church is called to be. So I'm praying today, Lord, with fresh courage that we would get a fresh grip on the Logos, the good news, we would get a fresh grip, Lord, on an ethos, that inner reality of the Holy Spirit working in us, and that our passion, our pathos for taking the gospel to those that need it, Lord, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, give us a fresh fire, and Lord, you would enable us, Lord, to, without fear, begin to explore new opportunities as a church. So, Lord, I just give you all the praise and the glory for each and every family, each and every home today. And I pray as we open up Acts 2 this morning, Lord, that your spirit would move through, that we would speak to each other, that we would challenge each other, that, Lord, we would even hold each other accountable for the words that we speak this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.